Happy to be here with my very special guest this week, award-winning filmmaker Erickson Dickens. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Derek. I appreciate you having me on. It's nice to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And we were talking beforehand, you know, you've got the exact same mic that, that I have, the the SM7B. I, I love your setup with the with the books in the background. Like that's, that's always a, a great go-to setup because you you do your own podcast, correct? We do. Um, some of most of the time, we actually do it out of a sprinter van that we have built out. My brother and I, we built out a sprinter van, got it all tricked out. So that's where we most of the time do them in person. And then when I'm doing them on my own, um, I, I have my little makeshift set up here. So yeah, I'm glad you like it. I, I put maybe 32 minutes into it total. So <laughs> yeah. uh, that that's about the same for mine. So no, I, I totally get that. But I love the idea of converting a van into a studio. It's almost like a, a traveling podcast. Exactly. Really cool. Exactly. Yeah. 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 A little different, right? Yeah, for sure. So I always like to start out these conversations with, with this question, because I've talked with, you know, a lot of actors, uh, screenwriters, directors, and everyone has their own unique story of how they got into the film industry. There's not like a, a roadmap or a how-to guidebook right. on how to do it. So what is your story? You know, what, how did you get involved in the world of filmmaking? Sure. Yeah. Great question. Um, so it started off when my brother and I were kids, right? We grew up on a ranch out here in the central Valley of California. Um, and we just were creatives from a young, from a young age, we love storytelling. And so we started making home movies when we were kids, right? Costumes, little scripts, the whole nine yards. Uh, and we loved it. We really enjoyed doing it. However, we were um, competitive athletes, right? We did the whole travel tournament stuff. I was a baseball guy. My brother was a swimmer. Um, and so our love of like movie making kind of took a back seat after a while. We focused on getting scholarships. Um, being athletes took up a lot of our time. Um, and so eventually, long story short, my brother and I, we both did get scholarships to college. And we ended up at the same college at a Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. I was a junior, my brother was a freshman, and uh, we both got injured, unfortunately. And so our sports careers got sidelined and we faced a bit of a, an identity crisis, right? We we're like, okay, what do we do with our lives now? Sports were such a big part of our lives for so long. Who are we now? Who are we as people? What do we want to do in life? And so after like six months of just kind of not a whole lot of doing anything, um, my brother, he was like, you know, why don't we, why don't we get back into filmmaking? Like, why don't we put some money together and get a camera and kind of rekindle that childhood passion of ours? And one thing led to another and that's how it all started. That was probably, I think, 2016. And ever since then, it's just snowballed ever since. That That's pretty incredible because, you know, and you bring up a great point that a, a lot of athletes, once their career is done, they do go through an identity crisis because it, it becomes such a big part of what you do because you get into the routine of, you know, you've got to go to practice. You've got to, you know, you might meal prep, you might you know, go through your, your workout routine. When all that gets derailed, it's like, what do I do? Right. No, it's, it's a little bit, I don't, I don't want to go as far and say traumatic, but when you have done something your whole life and it becomes such a big part of you, when it's gone, it, there's some of that existential dread to it. It's like, oh my gosh, like what, the goal that I've been working towards my whole life, that goal is no longer there. So what's my new goal? And so it, my brother and I, we, we spent a lot of time um, dabbling on certain paths that would have probably led us down to uh, not a good outcome. Um, and so, uh, you know, luckily filmmaking came back into our lives and we kind of curb some of those potential uh, outcomes. And um, yeah, one thing led to another. And we found our identity again through filmmaking, through rekindling that creative spirit that we had when we were kids. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so what, um, once you guys decide, okay, we're, we're going to delve back into filmmaking, what were your next steps? What did you do from there? Sure. Well, we were, uh, we were self-taught, right? So we didn't go to film school. Um, I was a philosophy major actually, and my brother was a business major. So everything we, we, we kind of had to learn from watching YouTube videos, researching, just trial and error, right? Learn by doing. Um, and so we just started getting as much experience as we could. We started dabbling in anything and everything just to build a portfolio, um, you know, shooting friends, birthday events, doing sorority and fraternity videos. We did weddings. 
a um, little bit of anything and everything just to build that experience, make connections. And that's how the ball get rolling. Uh, the ball got rolling. And then eventually after about six months, we were like, you know what, let's, let's try to make a career out of this. Like, why not? Well, why not? So we started a, uh, a company platinum peak out of a dorm room. One of those kind of cliche stories started out of the dorm room. And then, um, after a while, we started to niche down a little bit more on um, how we can actually provide value for businesses through video um, instead of just giving them a sexy montage or whatever it might be. Like, let's actually identify their problem and then see how we can actually create a video that addresses that problem. Uh, most businesses, they their three main pillars are marketing, sales and people operations. So we started to design videos that specifically address those. Um, and then one thing led to another from there. And we started doing passion projects, which were more documentary films, um, did some personal ones. And then that is what really, um, really cultivated our love for storytelling even more. Like the documentaries were a whole different element, a whole different ball game. And so once we started doing the documentaries as passion projects, that's when we started to think, OK, how can we somehow incorporate documentaries as a vertical into our company as well? And so that led us down a whole different, different path as well. Um, since about 2017 now. So, yeah. How were those early years of, you know, you mentioned your brother and you started uh, platinum peak mm -hmm. and especially with, you know, today's day and age, if you start your own company or your own business, it's like, you're always working, you know, mm -hmm. you're always trying to find work. You've got to put food on the table. Um, how was that early time of mm -hmm. starting that business? It was hard. I'm not going to lie. I mean, not only because of the fact we didn't really know what we were doing, um, but just the fact like we had to sacrifice a lot. Right. So like in college, most of the time, like people are out partying and stuff. My brother and I were uh, like doing shoots. We were behind the keyboard editing until two or three in the morning when everyone else was out partying. Um, so we definitely sacrificed a lot of fun. We sacrificed a lot of socializing. Um, but we look back on it and it's like, we don't, we don't really regret it because we were able to build something um, at an early age and have since been able to make a career out of it. Um, but yeah, no, it wasn't easy. I mean, the, the, you have to learn, and that's the thing about filmmaking as well, is that there's so many, so many moving parts. There's so many variables, right? Pre-production, uh, production, post-production, the business side of things. There's just, there's so many moving parts. A lot of people, they just watch a video or whatever it might be, watch a film and they just see the tip of the iceberg. Right. They just see that final product, but they don't really know how much actually went into it in terms of the actual process. And then just learning how to do the process on top of that, you know, finding leads, the whole sales process, the contracts, getting everything organized. So, yeah, man, it was um, it was really, really tough um, in the beginning, but it, it all worked out. It, it did work out for the most part. So. Yeah. It's like the a graphic I've seen on social media, you know, kind of cycle through several times where it's like you see an iceberg and it's labeled mm -hmm. as, you know, like fame, money, notoriety. And then under the water, you see like sacrifice, hard work, you know, blood, sweat, tears, you know, people don't realize there's all this other stuff that goes into what, you know, even if it's like a 20 minute short, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of time and a lot of sacrifice, but as I'm sure you guys learned, you know, it, it's something that, you have to love mm -hmm. in order to do it because otherwise it's just going to drive you crazy. Yeah. You'll burn out very, very quickly if you don't absolutely love it. And luckily we really did have a strong passion for it. And so that passion was what propelled us forward and allowed us to keep going through the ups and downs and through those times where we wanted to crawl in a ball and just cry or just throw it in. Okay. We're not, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. Let's, this is just, this is, uh, this is supposed to be fun. It's not fun anymore when we're having to travel 12 hours for, you know, get up at four in the morning the next day to go shoot that kind of stuff. But you know what, it's just, if you don't enjoy the journey or at least try to see the golden nuggets along the journey and really relish in those and try to learn something from that, then what are you doing? It, it can't always just be about, like you said, the fame at the end or the fortune or whatever it might be. At some point, you got to really just appreciate the journey and just and just kind of soak it up, right? Soak it up. We get one life. So, yep, because you never know who you're going to meet or mm -hmm. what events are going to happen that will just change your life completely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, funny you say that. One of the first one of the first jobs we actually got was we got a connection. This is when we were in college. 
Uh, my brother wasn't even 21 yet at the time, but he uh, had a friend he met through college whose dad was starting a liquor company and he needed a bunch of content shot out, which included us traveling with him to all these like shows and stuff, um, the trade shows down in LA, like Hollywood and all that, where all the socialites will come out and he had his booth up and he's, um, you know, serving his drink and everything and the billboards he would buy out. And so we were shooting for this alcohol company for like a year. Uh, I mean, pretty good money too for like the start. We're like, okay, like, all right, this is right off the bat. We're already doing something right. We're getting a bunch of free alcohol to take home and shoot content with, and they're not asking for it back. So, you know, where that was going. Um, but yeah, man, it was, uh, that's just an example of what you said. Like, you never know the opportunities that will arise and the connections. The connections, man, connections are so important when you're starting off. I, I can't uh, underestimate, I, I understate that enough. Um, yeah, connections will will lead you to so many places. That had to have been like a young videographer's dream mm -hmm. to make decent money and you get to like film alcohol and then drink it. Like yeah. that, that's that's <laughs> oh man. Some yeah. bad things would have happened if I had been in that position. Yeah. Back, back then. But uh kind of diverting to um the documentary side of, mm -hmm. of your career. Um in twenty seventeen you directed a documentary called Um His Legacy, which was mm -hmm. based um on the life of your father. Uh so what um what led to kind of the inspiration for for doing this and kind of walk me through the journey of of making it a reality? Yeah. Um so that was about, we were probably six months in at that point to rekindling filmmaking, getting into the swing of things. And we were like, what if we really challenged ourselves here and took a stab at like a long form type of project, something with like more storytelling prowess, right? Like let's really challenge ourselves here and just go for it. And so we started to think, okay, like what, what can we make it about? And we figured, you know what? There's one story that we haven't really told. We all know it, we lived it, but the story hasn't been told. And so we felt like we just, we, we were compelled to tell it, right? It's near and dear to us. It's a story about uh, my dad's life. He passed away when we were kids. Um, he was my childhood baseball coach, uh, really instrumental in not only my life, but a lot of the, the kids, the players that he coached as well, my teammates, my friends. Um, really, really cool story um, there. Um, but we're like, okay, let's, let's, let's make it on, on his life, right? So that was the start of, about a two year process of bringing at the end of it, probably 40 people together on camera, including old players, family members, my dad's brothers, uh, parents of players, uh, just everyone we can kind of bring in to create that robust story, right? It's a documentary. You got to pull in all the different mouthpieces who can serve as, um, you know, the different mouthpieces for the different pillars of his life per se. And so, um, yeah, man, and we, we didn't know what we were doing and, uh, but it was a very, uh, almost therapeutic process, I could say, and very cathartic at the end of it. I felt like it helped give us a little closure, just kind of coming to um, acceptance of it a little bit more, being able to see it told in one big congruent fashion, um, and also bringing a lot of people together as well who lived it. Uh, it was just, it was special, man. It was really a special experience when it was done. We had an 80 minute documentary that we completed. Um, we premiered it in our hometown, about 300 people came or something like that. And it was just special and um, it, it's, it felt good. It was very intrinsically rewarding. I felt like we honored my dad and preserved his legacy. And then, um, I, you know, I can't really say that the production value was great by any means. I watch that thing now and I'm very proud of it, but at the same time, it makes me want to puke a little bit just because audio is horrible, it's choppy, you know, it's, you can tell it's very amateur. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's my, my favorite project I've ever been a part of, obviously, because it's so near and dear. And um, that just got the, the juices flowing in terms of our ideas of how we can continue on that path of serving other, other people with significant stories who might want their legacies preserved as well through a documentary. And I think that's such a brilliant concept because in you mentioning you know, your father and having all these people participate in the documentary and then having 300 people show up to the premiere that had to have been a pretty emotional moment for you because mm -hmm. you know you you realize you, the impact that an individual has had based off the, the people that show up to celebrate them mm -hmm. you know so yeah. that that had to how how was that for you when you 
it's when you realize like especially at the premiere when you realize that this large crowd mm-hmm. has you know gathered to to honor your father mm-hmm. how was that feeling for you overwhelming i mean it was it was i was very emotional and i actually had to stand up and give a speech just a little bit at the beginning thanking everyone for coming just talking a little bit about everything and i choked up man like it was hard looking out there and I was seeing people that I really didn't even know that my dad had any type of connection with. I had no connection with them, but somehow they were there. And then they would tell me after, you know, your dad did, did X, Y, and Z. Um, and he was, he was a teacher as well. He was a math teacher. And we heard from a lot of people just, you know, the impact that he had in the classroom as well. So not just the baseball field, but I learned, I learned a lot about my dad throughout that process, not just the actual process of filming it and the pre-production and stuff, but just afterwards, like after we we premiered it and posted it on YouTube, more comments and stuff, more phone calls, more Facebook messages would just start coming in of stories about my dad that I didn't even know about. And, you know, it just, it, it, it it was, it was a cool experience. And um, there were a lot of tears in the audience. I do remember that very vividly, you know, and watching my dad's life play out on camera. Uh, I felt very vulnerable, obviously. And that was, I'm, I'm not, I struggle with that sometimes I'll admit like I'm not the most openly vulnerable person um but like just putting all putting it all out there his story my story the emotions that all went through it and examining how his death affected everyone I felt kind of naked but in a sense I I grew from that as well so in a lot of ways it helped me grow as a person not just as a filmmaker you know right and and you you can't help that you know whenever you tackle a project that is so emotional to you you know you you almost have to grow as mm-hmm. a person because of the the things that you learn you know and you mentioning you learn things about your dad that you know you didn't know uh, until after you after the the documentary had premiered mm-hmm. uh, when during the process of making the documentary were there any specific stories that say people were talking because you said that it has a very almost kind of amateurish look to it because you were still kind of mm-hmm. finding your way and learning. Mm-hmm. But was were there particular moments that had an emotional impact on you throughout the, the process of making the documentary? Yeah, I would say one big one was just hearing about like how my dad uh, as a kid, hearing from his brothers, he has uh, three, uh, three brothers. So my three uncles, they're still currently alive, still all very close with all of them and just really peeling back their childhood and just his love for baseball at an early age and hearing them talk about how all he wanted to do was go out in the front lawn and play baseball. And, you know, you can kind of picture it Four brothers growing up on a dairy and rural central California. Um, it just kind of, yeah, it it made me think about my dad as a kid because I just knew him as a man, but then starting to kind of view my dad as a kid and just, just this, passion for a game right and there's just something so beautiful and innocent about that in a way so that 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 was definitely emotional just hearing all that emotional in a good way you know not like a heartbreaking way but just it was just cool and then um obviously the more heartbreaking stuff later when my my dad he uh, he had brain cancer so you know that that really tore him apart right i mean he he deteriorated from a very healthy 44 year old man into somebody who couldn't take care of himself at all. Um, and so watching him, you know, as like my protector, as he was a father figure, um, the man who kind of made me deteriorate into what he did, definitely that part of the documentary uh, was difficult to get to. Not, not just filming it, but the editing process, because I did all the editing myself. So, you know, it's like rewatching all the clips and having to make it yeah, that, that, that took a little bit of a toll. I mean, I do remember the editing process being very just emotionally drained by the whole thing. I remember talking to my mom and I was like, mom, I think I might have bit off a little bit more than I can chew here. Like, I just want this to get done. I'm just really having a hard time. Um, and she, she helped remind me like what I was doing just to, you know, have boundaries, don't kill myself over it. Um, but you know, what you're doing is honoring your dad and, you know, he's looking down on you very proud. So yeah. Yeah. And that uh, props to you for doing that because I, I can speak from experience because of my, I had a, a good friend of mine uh, back in 2012. Uh, he passed away in a car accident. Um, I'm sorry. At, at, uh, thank you. He was only 21 years old. And we 
we shot some videos documentary style to kind of honor his life because you know he had even though he was at a young age he had a lot of friends and made you know a, a big impact on people and as i was putting them together much like you said you know i i got to a point where it hit me and then i just f- tears came flooding out of me and i'm like i don't know if i can do it but i told myself i'm like no i i have to do it like i feel like i would have been doing him a disservice if i didn't do it yeah so props I, props to you for that well thank you and how, how did you feel like after you did finally get through it the tears and everything how did it make you feel um it i was grateful to be done and i kept telling myself okay i've i wanted to do justice to his life because he was such a positive person he was never in a bad mood he always had this huge grin on his face and he made a lot of people happy and i i wanted to to honor that so i i felt I felt like I had done that Mm -hmm. even though I was just emotionally just drained after it, but I I was happy that I did it. Yeah. Yeah. Is is that how you felt as well? For sure. Yeah. You summed it up very well. Like, yeah, you you hit it on the nail, hit it on. Yeah. Yeah. And and since then you've done um, some other legacy documentaries. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you talk to me a little bit about those? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, after we finished that film and everything, like I said, you know, my brother and I just, we want, we wanted to do more, um, for other people as well. We figured, you know, we have a bit of a talent here. Let's continue to cultivate it. We like doing documentaries. Um, and so, but we need to get better first. And so we started still doing more passion projects. We did a couple more, um, and then we just started feeling more and more confident um to to actually approach people and and offer this as an offer right with with money involved with a budget involved um i think our first one we did was uh what we we would classify as a legacy documentary was for um rotary international we did uh it's called two magic drops and we actually went to india my brother went to india and followed a group of rotarians around india Um, polio is an issue there it's almost eradicated but at the time it's 2020 um, there are still some village villages that need to be inoculated. So in that case, we weren't really preserving a single person's legacy. It was more so Rotary as an organization, the legacy in terms of what they've been doing to eradicate polio. Um, so we did that. That was a short documentary, about 15 minutes long. Um, and that one actually, it got us some, uh, some attention on like the festival circuit. I think we got accepted to 12 or 13 different film festivals around the country um we won best documentary at three or four you know when i'm not talking sundance film festival here by any means but it was cool you know it just it gave us that reassurance that okay you know we we are definitely on to something here and then from that point on we started to hit it a little bit harder um, with our marketing you know doing email campaigns targeting different people family foundations um who might have uh, significant stories who would want their legacies preserved and we did one on a gentleman who migrated here from Lebanon at an early age in the seventies came from nothing, came from war torn Lebanon. Uh, His mom passed away when he was a kid, just very, very humble beginnings, moved to America. um, And with 50, $52 in his pocket or something and grew a, grew an empire has five successful kids. Now Um, he's happily retired. Um, Just an amazing, amazing, amazing life. And, uh, that's just another example. That was a two hour film we did on him. His estate hired us and um, spent two years with that family, getting to know them ins and outs, became family with them is what it felt like. So um, yeah, I can give you a few more examples, but those, those two stick out, I think, you know? Yeah. And I was curious about that is, that, you know, do you almost feel like you become part of the family because you're having to spend so much time with them to, you know, tell the individual story because you want to, you want to do their story right, especially, you know, somebody who immigrates to America with $52 in their pocket and a story like that should absolutely be told because that's, that's the American dream right there is coming from little to nothing and being that successful. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing story. And that like, that inspires me to to go out and make something right now. So I can't imagine how it would feel to actually sit down and watch it. 
For sure, for sure. And uh, on that note, like what you said about becoming family with them, that gentleman, he actually, he didn't really want a document. He did not want a documentary made. It was more so his five kids that wanted the film made about his life. They wanted to have something um, that preserved his legacy, his story. They wanted to learn more about him and the ins and outs of his life. Um, they wanted to be able to show this to their kids and then their kids. Um, but the man, the gentleman, his name's Charles, he, uh, he wasn't too hot on it. He's a little bit reserved. And I remember when I first met him, he was, I don't want to say cold, but just you could tell that he, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to warm this guy up, right? And so that started the long process of just getting to know this man, building his trust, earning his vulnerability. That way he actually can open up to me and tell me all the nitty gritty details of his life. Tell me about his pain, the obstacles that he went through. You know, you can't, you can't just sit down with somebody with a list of questions without talking to them once before, building in your rapport and just expect them to open up to you, right? The, the, the quality of the output at the end is not going to be a reflection of uh, time that it takes to actually get in there and, and build that trust. So, yes. Yeah, so by the, by the end of it, it's actually funny. You know, we we're, we're friends now, like we, we call and we talk. Um, and he went from not being real keen on the whole thing to ask, when are you going to come down and visit? When are you going to come down? You know? So they said, we felt like family to them at the end. So like, it just, it, that was, that was, you know, that, that's one of my favorite parts about the whole thing is building those relationships, you know? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And that's actually an excellent segue into what I wanted to ask you next, because, you know, when you're doing these documentaries, you know, you can potentially deal with some pretty heavy subject matter and you, you want to try and make the, the interviewee feel as comfortable as possible. So what's some advice that you could give you to say a, an aspiring documentary filmmaker on trying to get your interviewees to you know, open up and be more comfortable with you. Right. Try your best to always make sure that they know that you're not coming at them with any type of judgment, right? Like your job is reassuring them that you will, you will do everything in your power to make them look good, right? We don't have to cross any boundaries that you're not comfortable with. Um, you know, we can poke at some certain things, but if you feel resistance, you know, back off and then maybe try to revisit it later. Um, just being, being very respectful of people's boundaries. Don't just jump into it by saying like, for example, so I heard your wife died a few years ago. How was that? No, let's talk about your wife first. You know, tell me some positive memories about her. Um, you know, what was the one thing that you guys loved doing together? What was your favorite food? Just that kind of stuff. And then when you start building that trust, it's like breadcrumbs and eventually you'll get there. Um, one thing that helped for me personally is just like, you know, I, I came from trauma. Um, you know, my, my dad, like we've been talking about, he passed as well. And sometimes people are willing to open up to you a little bit more if they get an idea about what you've gone through as well. So that was a way for me to kind of break the ice a little bit in some circumstances where it came up, I was willing and able to share what happened with me. And I think that probably helped in some ways. Um, you know, like for example, the, the, the man, he, Charles, the man who immigrated from Lebanon, like his wife passed away um, when he was when she was in her 50s from early onset, early onset dementia. And so her five kids, their five kids suffered through that whole thing. And so I knew that having to interview their five kids on the loss of a parent, uh, you know, that that's traumatic for them. And I, I'm positive. I'm sure that they still they have to have scars. Right. That's so scarring to lose a, a parent at that age to dementia. Um, and so I knew that approaching that, I'd have to be delicate with it. And um, I don't want to bring stuff up that maybe they're not comfortable talking with. That's not my place, but I think it helped a little bit them knowing that I had experienced something similar, right? And I, I empathize with them and I, I want to do my best to not only preserve uh, their mother's memory, but you know, work with them to get to where we need to be at their pace. That's what it comes down to. No, I couldn't have said it better myself. And yeah, I do find that people will open up more if, like you mentioning the story with your dad and saying what you had gone through and seeing, you know, how you've dealt with it can inspire people to be like, okay, well, if he can do this after overcoming this trauma, then maybe I can too. For sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 If you can. And that's something that I've tried to do. I tried to do in my life as well. It's just like if, being that example, you know, like I came from that, that horrible experience, but I kind of turned that bad experience into something 
positive by using it as fuel in a way to tell stories that matter, you know, hopefully positively impact people's lives. So I do hope that uh, at the end of the day, like my legacy, people will be able to see that, you know, I, I tried to make the world a little bit better of a place just by my my talent that I have and then the small ways that I can. So I hope people do see that. Absolutely. Uh, as we start to wrap up here, I, I did want to ask you what's next for you. Uh, do you guys have any other um, documentaries or projects in the works? Yeah, actually. So we just um, locked down this really cool project about a month ago. It's for a family foundation out of Texas. Um, amazing story. Um, and the family hired us to preserve the not only the foundation's legacy, what they do, what they stand for, but the man who started it as well. He, he's no longer with us, but a really incredible rags to riches story. Um, so that's our next big project. We'll be working on it for probably, gosh, probably the next year. Our first shoot is at the end of April out in Fort Worth. Um, so we're excited about that. And then, yeah, that'll, that'll be a, a feature film. So about an hour and a half long and that's that's our big focus right now in the world of documentary stuff. So we're excited about that. Fantastic. And do you yeah. have a website or social media that you'd like to plug so the viewers and listeners can follow you? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about our documentary stuff, you can find us on dickensbrothers.com. And then if you want to see a little bit more about our agency side of stuff, so that's videos that are more so tailored towards sales, marketing, people operations. And you can check us at our agency site, which is platinumpeak.com and peak is with two E's. Fantastic. Well, Erickson, thank you so much for taking the time to have this chat. This was amazing. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed being on. Thank you.